before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. The backbone in the middle is often what is sort of taken for granted. And so that's also the thing when, you know, situations get difficult, that's the most endangered. I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Well, amazingly enough, it's now the spring of 2021. That means the weather is warming, the grass is greening, the little buds are drinking in the cool rain. But more to the point, it means that we've made it through the terrible pandemic winter and are emerging into a strange new world very much changed by a full year under the coronavirus. In the art industry, normality is still far in the distance, but we've learned a whole slew of lessons that have perhaps made us better adapted for the future ahead. What those changes have been and what those lessons might be are the subject of Artnet News' new spring edition of our biannual intelligence report, which mines reams of auction results from the Artnet price database, along with dozens of interviews with art professionals, to explain the state of the art market today. So what did we find out? To discuss, I'm very happy to have Artnet News executive editor and intelligence report editor Julia Halpern on the show today to cast some light on a dark year. Thanks very much for coming back on The Art Angle, Julia. Thanks for having me. So a year ago, almost to the day of this recording, we released an episode of The Art Angle titled, somewhat hubristically in retrospect, Three Ways Coronavirus Will Transform the Art World. You appeared on that episode. So remind me, what did we think was going to happen to the art market back then? So I think we thought that a bunch of galleries were going to close We were really worried about the fate of the middle market. So not the very top and not emerging artists, but galleries who work with artists who are in the middle of their careers. And we were thinking that potentially also really rich people were just going to go into their turtle shells and not spend tons of money because it just seemed like the state of the world was so incredibly uncertain. And so, you know, I think some people were expecting to see the kind of drop in both private and public spending on art that we saw in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis when I think total auction sales fell 40%. So I think everybody was just really, really nervous and really kind of like frozen looking around waiting to see what terrible things were going to happen. It's interesting that you single out the middle market because the middle market is kind of classically the unloved stepchild of the art industry. Why is that again? In so many markets, you've got like a winner takes all situation where you've got like the star basketball players and then the people who are really interested in the basketball players who are just coming up. It's just the human nature, right? It's the thing that powers whatever field you're in that so often gets overlooked. Us as journalists, too, we focus on the big numbers and we focus on the hot, sexy, new, young thing. And the backbone in the middle is often what is sort of taken for granted. And so that's also the thing when, you know, situations get difficult, that's the most endangered. So did this happen? Did the super wealthy really grab onto their money and keep it tight? Did the middle market suffer? Did galleries shut all over the place? Did that actually happen? So we were about 50 percent right and 50 percent wrong. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I think we were (laughs) very wrong because rich people made a ton of money, as we now know. Billionaires in America saw their total wealth increase by 40 percent over the course of the pandemic. And they spent a lot of that money. They didn't always spend it publicly. You know, there were a lot of big transactions that we heard about that happened privately. But even at auction, stuff that got to market that made its way to the auction block did pretty well. So people were spending money, rich people feeling good, nothing to worry about there. And in terms of galleries, you know, I think the thing that we didn't expect that we heard from them was that they saved just like all of us, I think, they saved a lot more money than they thought. Just like I'm not paying my like $34 to go to a boutique fitness class more times a week than it should be known. They're not spending their money on art fairs, which are the boutique fitness class 
of the art market. <laughs> they saved a lot and I think realized in a lot of cases how much money they were actually spending on these things. And so it enabled them to, you know, I don't think always come out in the black or break even, but lose a lot less than they thought they were going to. I mean, it's fascinating because it kind of makes it clear that our predictions were based on if everybody keeps on doing exactly everything they're doing in this pandemic context, there's going to be a lot of failures and bankruptcies. And what we didn't anticipate was that people wouldn't do and they wouldn't be able to do the same kind of things that they had been doing in the normal times. So you have all these rich people who weren't spending money on very fancy trips or blah, blah, blah. Instead, they're very bored. <laughs> they're locked up in their houses. They're looking at maybe blank walls where they're holding their Zoom meetings from. And they just have a lot of money to burn. That's the same thing that happened with the galleries. They saved a lot more money than they thought they were going to spend. How did this kind of reorienting of the money flow impact the art market in terms of the different businesses? Because we've got the galleries, we've got the auction houses, we've got the art fairs. How did that kind of unsettle things across this landscape? So I think we're in a very different place now than we were a year ago or nine months ago. The first thing that happened is that everyone was looking for where they could cut costs. Everyone experienced a kind of both supply and demand shock. And so auction houses cut staff or combined departments, uh, galleries, especially big galleries, laid off a considerable number of people, particularly staff that were dedicated to art fairs. So we saw a lot of contraction. I think that also helped balance books. So I think it's important to note that part of the reason that these businesses come out feeling a little better than they might have is because they also shed staff and that had an impact on real people. So auction houses, they got lean, they got online, and they lost money, but not as much as they probably thought. Galleries, I think, saved money, got lean, and lost money, but not as much as they probably thought. Appraisers is an interesting one. I mention it because it's a sector that we looked at for the report that we don't normally look at. And it's one that had this like weird extreme boom bonanza. You mentioned that there are all these people sitting at home looking at their white walls and thinking about art for the first time or people who don't normally think about it started to think about it. And those people and people who collect and, you know, maybe don't invest money regularly in art started to think about the value of what they owned. And so appraisers found this period of time where people are sitting at home looking at what they've got and calling them up and their phones are ringing off the hook to get a sense of what their collection is worth. The other sector I would mention is obviously art fairs. And they had, I think, the toughest time. You just can't translate the sort of time-limited frenetic social energy onto the web the way that maybe you can a little bit in an auction. And so, you know, I think that they have really struggled in figuring out how to get through to the other side. So you mentioned appraisers, and obviously you only really need an appraiser when you want to appraise something to bring to market. So tell me how the pandemic has impacted the selling strategy of people who consign their artworks to auction? Well, first thing I would say is you also need an appraiser when you want to take a loan out on your art, which is something that we've seen also happen during this period of time. Art-backed loans have become increasingly utilized by people who have big collections. In terms of how consigners' approaches and attitudes have evolved, first, I think if you have a really expensive once in a decade artwork, you don't want to sell it in the middle of a pandemic. You just, you don't. There's too many unknowns. I think it's not worth it. So people who could afford to hold on to their treasures did. There's a divorcing couple, Harry and Linda Macklow, who have a unbelievable collection that's worth around $700 million full of Warhols and Bryce Martins and lots of other things. And their collection was expected to be this kind of big brouhaha for 2020. And when the world started shutting down, they 
officially postpone their plans to sell, even though it was something that a court had ordered, was sort of agreed upon that it would be in the best interest of everyone to wait. There are lots of other people who have to sell. If it's an estate that needs to meet a tax burden or you just need the money, people did put things up for sale. And I think if they did, they were more inclined to take a financial guarantee, something that would assure them a certain price to kind of assuage their jitters. And they moved ahead and they did okay because the auction houses were also really careful about what they put in these sales. I think that perception and appearance has never been more important than it was during this past year. And so they worked really hard to make sure that if they put something in a sale and they put it out, it was going to sell, which means you saw a lot of last minute withdrawals and stuff being yanked from the auction block because they just didn't think they had enough interest to make it work. I mean, you're talking about the Macklow collection, which was famously a lot of modern contemporary art. How did the various different sectors of the auction market, from the old masters to the impressionist and moderns, to the contemporaries, to the ultra contemporaries, how did they get differently impacted by the contraction or the changing of the economy during this pandemic? I'm going to start with the newest ultra contemporary, which was also the only sector of the market that grew last year. Ultra contemporary is our term for artists born after 1974. And that sector saw total sales go up almost a third, 32.5%. It's a small piece of the pie in total. It's $200 million out of the whole auction market. But it was clearly an area where there was a lot of activity. And part of that is that the price points are lower. So people were more willing to take a risk and stick their neck out. Also, I think people are more comfortable still paying slightly lower price points online. And this is a sector where every year you get more stuff because it's not like old masters where what you have in that market is what you're going to get. It's continually regenerating. So that continues to be a really interesting area to watch. Post-war and contemporary art remained the sort of biggest slice of the market and saw a decline of around 30%, which is a number that you kind of see across the board. A lot of things fell around 30%. (laughs) And the same with uh, Impressionist and Modern also fell around that amount. One thing that was interesting about the old masters is that the report says that there was more action on the old master market online. That's true. I mean, that's mostly anecdotal. Before this, I think it was considered basically unheard of to bid on an old master without having seen it in person. Condition is so important in that field that it would be thought of as like kind of barbaric. But I think partially because of necessity and partially because you had different kinds of people bidding on old masters, you know, it's just as easy to click into an old master sale on Sotheby's site as it is to click into a contemporary sale. And so people who might not have shown up in person to go to one would take a peek and maybe place a bid. And so these are people for whom the kind of traditional ways of approaching this market are not so relevant. So it sounds like we're ascribing the change in these various markets to the quality of inventory that is brought to sale. Is there any indication that Changing taste is also a factor here. It's so hard sometimes to unknot the the supply versus demand element. I do think that we saw increased activity from Asian collectors, and that meant that we saw a lot more demand and high prices for particularly Chinese contemporary artists than we've seen. I mean, this was the first year that we've been keeping track that Chinese artists dominated the contemporary category. So four out of the 10 best-selling contemporary artworks were by Chinese artists, and more than half of the 10 were sold in Hong Kong or mainland China. Unknotting that is always hard to tell. You know, the question is, in a different year, would higher value works that were held back had been consigned to New York. And then, you know, we'd see a return to status quo where New York is generally the place where we see really expensive stuff by American and European artists sell. You know, I think that it's clear that supply at the high level 
in the market at the top is really the determining factor, but that we're seeing that in a moment of global stress, Asia emerged as a place with more consistent demand. And over the past couple of years, the United States and China have kind of been seesawing a little bit in terms of who can claim the larger chunk of the art market, especially the auction market. How has that kind of dynamic been impacted by this pandemic and, and where is it today? So this was the first year in a number of years that China outpaced the U.S. in terms of total auction sales. And that has a lot more to do with how far the U.S. fell than China climbing. But China just proved a lot more resilient, I think, in part because it took way more aggressive measures to contain the pandemic. Also, billionaires in the U.S. did really well last year, but billionaires in China did even better. So you saw the total sales in China fall only 0.1% compared to the U.S., which was about 35%. So China was the biggest art market in the world last year. But I don't necessarily think that that is going to remain the case next year. Identity and inclusion have become so much more central to a lot of the conversations around the art market, around the art world. Was that something that we saw reflected in the kinds of art that people were buying and they were bidding for and they were competing for over the past year? So at the very top levels of the market, the answer is no. There were, I think, in the top 10 ultra contemporary artists, which is an area where we've seen the most changing. That's the one that changes the most because there's new people entering the fold every six months. There were no black artists in the top 10 and one woman, Dana Schutz, and a good number of Asian artists, Matthew Wong and Jia Ali both had very prominent presences. But I think it does suggest that the kind of prevailing market wisdom that, for example, you know, the market for work by Black artists was just completely taken off into another stratosphere. I think that that is a kind of false assumption. I think that you're seeing people kind of speculate on different artists every six months. I think it's a really challenging thing for the artists. I think it's a really challenging thing for galleries that are trying to develop stable careers. The fact that you get so much turnover every time in this list is sort of symbol that there are forces in the market that are doing a kind of pump and dump. And it's really hard to kind of gain control over a market when that happens. So right now, where the vaccine is spreading throughout the United States and Europe, not so much, but it is spreading through the places that have the art market capitals. We've also got warming weather, bringing things back to normal. And we also know, just from scanning the headlines these days, you know that people are spending tremendous amounts of money on pretty wacky stuff. So... Is there any indication that this year is going to be a more welcoming place for some of these whales to be bringing their artworks for sale, that, you know, the auctions are going to be more stuffed and more high quality? Or is this still going to be a year of recovery that's going to be in line with 2020? I think the first half of the year, people will still be fairly judicious. We're seeing a few big lots being consigned for the spring sales. You know, so there is a sign that there's going to be some kind of fuel in the tank. But I think you're not going to see real frenzy or real kind of energy return until the fall. And at that point, I do think that there's going to be a kind of buzz of activity and then things will kind of level out. Okay, last thing on auctions is that in the intelligence report, you make very plain that, you know, previously the auction season was pretty much governed by a couple of tentpole sales that were scattered at very predictable points of the year. Like in New York, you would have the spring sales, then you'd have the fall sales in terms of modern contemporary. And these were really the, you know, the high points of the market. Over the course of the pandemic, 
when everything went online, the seasonality started to go out the window and you got hit with announcement after announcement of these kind of more like flash sale type auctions that were, you know, selling lower priced artworks, maybe lower quality artworks at a Gatling gun kind of rhythm. Do you think that this year those kinds of online sales are going to fade away? Do you think they're going to be continuing alongside these bigger sales? How are the changes of the past year going to adapt and evolve into the immediately foreseeable future? I think we're absolutely going to see the sort of drumbeat of online sales stay in place. I mean, I think that the struggle that auction houses have always had is that they have been historically locked into this schedule, which means that they aren't able to treat art as liquid at all. Obviously, art is not a liquid asset, but if you've got a sale every two weeks, it's a lot easier to cash in than it has been in the past. And so I think we're going to continue to see that a lot. That has become a real competitive edge for these auction houses. And I think we will see that the big sales, they're still going to have them. I mean, there's so much theater around them, even when it's live streamed. I mean, you've got Sotheby's most recent old master sale was sponsored by Bulgari and the people taking bids were all like dripping in Bulgari jewels. And it was such a production. You know, I think that the kind of eventness of these big evening sales is still such a selling point for them. And so you're going to see those remain. You know, they might not be exactly in the same weeks that they always were. I think now that they've kind of rested themselves out of that very narrow schedule, they will embrace the wiggle room. But now auction specialists are going to be faced with a sort of different calculus of, okay, now that I have the choice between a live sale and an online sale, where am I going to put stuff? And so now they're faced with this real sea change where they're going to have to figure out how to spread this material across those two platforms. So that's kind of a pretty good problem to have. So let's move on to the art galleries, a sector that prior to the pandemic was largely ruled by these mega galleries that strode the globe like tasteful T-Rexes, you know, while smaller dealerships kind of scurried underfoot like the little animals in the, you know, in the prehistoric jungle. So what happened to art galleries over the past year? It was a similar situation to auction houses where at the beginning, I think they felt like nobody was buying anything. They had nowhere to show. They felt completely adrift. You know, they thought that potentially they would have a kind of deus ex machina from online viewing rooms, also known as websites, where they would post artworks with kind of varying amounts of fanfare We all really put in the college try to get excited about online viewing rooms and not very many people could really get there. As time went on, as people started realizing that they had some extra money in their pockets, people started connecting to galleries a bit more. You know, I think that the things that are selling are the things that would sell in any moment, right? Every gallery or lots of galleries have one or two artists that are very highly in demand or much more in demand than other artists on their roster those are doing fine. You know, good stuff is moving, but I think that galleries are struggling with the rest of it. You know, they have certainly seen sales decline probably 30% or more. The money that they've saved on art fairs has really helped bridge that gap, but I don't think that will last them forever. You know, I think that they're going to have to see some more activity piping up in order to feel secure. You know, you kind of have to wonder about the biggest galleries that, you know, their hallmark for a long time has been having all of these really, you know, glamorous, astonishing spaces in the fanciest, most expensive neighborhoods of the biggest cities all over the world. And they have really expensive real estate and they can't really sell through their galleries. They're doing the online stuff. They're not really able to do the art fairs. Are they in a better or worse position than a small gallery that has a a hot roster of up-and-coming artists that are priced to sell for uh, investment-like potential that maybe have far fewer and far cheaper real estate overhead? It's a good question. I'm sure it depends 
gallery to gallery. I would love to have everybody's balance sheet in front of me. I do think that big galleries have kept these big spaces the way that big designer jewelry companies keep a big store on Fifth Avenue. It's not about the volume of people coming in. It's about how much money the small number of people coming in have and are willing to spend. And so I don't think that that dynamic has fundamentally changed. You know, I don't think that galleries have ever made a ton of money off of walk-ins. You know, there's these spaces are about wowing the people with money and about giving artists an inspiring and exciting place to show their work. You know, I do think that there are other elements of gallery infrastructure when you get that big that they probably are thinking about critically right now. You know, there have been all of these publications that galleries produce that are glossy and thick and cost a ton of money to print. You know, big infrastructure with art fair teams, tons of staff that you have that are coming in to do, you know, programming and public programming and things like that. I imagine when they're looking really brutally at their balance sheet, those are the things that they consider to be kind of expendable. And the real estate, I think, is so important for appearances that it's rare that you're going to see them pull back too much on that. I mean, we did see a little bit. We saw Marianne Goodman, legendary dealer, decide to close her space in London and opt for more of a pop-up approach. And I think you may see that, you know, that galleries decide they can still get the sort of razzle-dazzle by renting out a really impressive space for a short-term project. But I think that the importance of an international presence and dramatic settings to show art will remain a top priority. Okay. So you mentioned that one of the reasons that galleries were not as badly hit by the pandemic as expected was because they were able to cut their art fair costs, which is great for the galleries, but it's not good for the art fairs because that's their source of revenue. So what has happened to the art fairs? How have they fared in the pandemic? Yeah, I think the art fairs have definitely been the hardest hit because they just have the fewest other options or other ways to do the business they do. So you did see after kind of an initial wave of cancellations, galleries created these virtual fairs, online viewing rooms where dealers could sort of showcase a selection of their inventory or their artists work um, all in one place. And after they canceled their sort of first fair of the year, and then after that, they all started charging relatively modest amounts, you know, a few thousand dollars to galleries to participate in these events. I think just out of necessity that they needed to start getting money in. And they're finding other ways to try to create this sort of middle ground between a full-fledged fair and a virtual fair or a sort of free website or a a kind of fully-fledged online program. So for Art Basel Hong Kong, Art Basel is offering galleries who can't come in person or who don't want to quarantine for the equivalent of like a month in total to have satellite booths on site that will be staffed by an Art Basel staff member, but their art will be there and can be sort of seen in person and they will be able to be reached at any time during the opening hours of the fair. And so, you know, you see fairs sort of really trying to develop something that can kind of tide them over in the interim. And it's going to be hard until people can move around and go places without feeling worried. Yeah, that's the tricky thing for the fairs, because all, you know, the auction houses, the galleries, they've all kind of figured out some way of making the digital, you know, online experience work. They figured out some way of saving costs, but the fairs don't seem to have really made a meaningful development in terms of their online presence. And they also can't really cut their costs that much because they are these big gala in-person glossy kinds of things. So has there been any real positive learning experience for the art fairs? I do think that for them, their value proposition for galleries, right, is that they can put galleries in front of collectors that they wouldn't have otherwise encountered. They are a middleman, which is why I think this has been so hard for them. Whereas, you know, auction houses are dealing directly with sellers and collectors. Galleries are dealing directly with artists and collectors. Art fairs are not essential to any transaction. But I think that they realize that their value proposition is 
acting as a funnel. And so galleries that have really been leaning on people that they know or have had trouble breaking into new markets, you know, I think that that has always been and remains what fairs do best is helping them connect with new audiences. And I think that they're really owning that as what they bring to the table, as opposed to hosting galleries on a website. Undeniably, there's this kind of uh, elephant in the art market that we have very conspicuously not mentioned yet. And, you know, we should maybe point out that the Spring Intelligence Report closed before this whole NFT phenomenon burst into public view. But now you see, you know, $69 million being spent on people at Christie's, you know, millions of dollars are being transacted on something that is not on anybody's radar, at least in in my very old, boring uh, <laughs> you know, circle. So how do NFTs figure into this boring, old, normy art market that we've been discussing? So I don't know is the first answer. You know, I think we've seen, obviously, Christie's made the first move in hosting the Beeple sale and Sotheby's is on their heels hosting a sale of an NFT by an artist named Pac. And you see galleries not necessarily yet signing NFT only artists, but certainly working with artists who want to experiment in the medium and experiment with NFTs. I think that the main way that we're going to see this mania manifest is that the art world just realized that there are a ton of rich people that they don't even know. It's like digging in your backyard and finding gold. Like there's just this whole new population of people who are willing to spend money on collectibles, who have it to spend in spades. And so I think what's going to be really interesting is to see how, you know, a field that is very into in-person interactions with an object and is elitist sometimes is going to try to endear itself to the crypto world and specifically the crypto wealthy. Okay, so now uh, here's where I want to say that I love art fairs, but I think that this is maybe a little bit of a problem for them because if you pay a lot of money to show in an art fair, the new collectors that you are likely to meet are just going to be more different art fair collectors, people who are predisposed to go to an art fair. But the audience that is springing up around NFTs is decidedly online and is decidedly not an art fair collector. This is a totally different universe of potential art market converts. How is that going to reshape the way that the art market operates? The thing that I can imagine is just that every single person who runs an art business is realizing that, yeah, the first contact that they make with these new potential buyers has to be online, right? Like they're not going to just show up and wait in line to buy a ticket or open the mail, God forbid, to get a VIP pass. I mean, I'm sure they're thinking about it right now. I mean, it's only been like two weeks. I'm sure that fairs are thinking, you know, how are they going to connect with this new class of crypto collector and try to get them to engage? All right. So finally, we've talked a lot about the things that have changed, the different trials and tribulations that different art businesses have endured. What hasn't changed? What is still exactly the same as it was before that is here to stay? I mean, one thing I think is that's kind of warm and fuzzy, but people really do love seeing art in person. I know it's sacrilegious to the NFT conversation to say, but everyone I have spoken to has said that the value of experiencing art in person, whether it's at an auction preview or at a gallery show or at a museum, has really become clear in its absence this year. And so I do think you're going to see a sort of desire to re-engage that way. And you see galleries, you know, as much as they are investing in online infrastructure, you're also hearing about galleries opening new spaces or moving into different spaces in New York City and not necessarily smaller ones or ones upstairs, but equally prominent ground floor spaces, because I think that they recognize that that kind of connection is always going to be really important to them. All right. Well, Thanks very much for coming on The Art Angle, Julia. It's it's great to hear about the art market. And, and I just want to give you a moment to plug the intelligence report. What do you think 
people listening to this show should know about the intelligence report? You know, why should they read it? I think it's the best art market journalism out there. It is a rare opportunity to combine storytelling and the best art market data in the business. And I think if you read it, you will walk away with a sense in a kind of one-stop shop of what has happened and what may happen in the art market. And it's free and you can download it at artnet.com slash artnet intelligence report. And I would love to know what you think. So that's it for this week's episode of The Art Ankle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.